Today I am joined by Pat Osterman, the legend, the great one. I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable saying that. But welcome. I got to tell you, right before I recorded this podcast, I talked to one of my softball pitchers and I said, hey, I got to do this podcast. And she's like, you got to be kidding me. How can I hear that before it goes live? Oh, that's awesome. That's yes. Awesome. So talk to me about, I want to, before we, before we get into your softball career, you are a psychology major, you have a master's in psychology, you're a coach, and you're a player. How does all that balance together in kind of that performance world? Well, you know, I think I really got interested in the mental part of the game in high school. Um, I decided probably sophomore or junior year that I was going to go to school, get a psychology degree. My whole plan was to get into sports psychology, um, not coaching, but just sports psychology, even though that is a, a branch of coaching in some, well, some say, ways. You do it more <laughs> <Yeah>. than I do. <laughs> um, but, you know, obviously I got a coaching job out of school and was able to jump into actual on-field coaching right away. But um, it's just always something that interests me. And I think because starting at a young age, I was never – I shouldn't say never. I wasn't always the best pitcher that we had. Um, I can remember going to my first travel team and I got the mop up innings. Um, and then I remember, you know, people telling me, my dad, that when we left Little League to go to a travel team, she's never going to make it. You know, you're making a mistake. And I was like, no, I'm not. You know, we're going to go somewhere. She's going to learn. Um, we're going to figure this out. And, and we did. And, you know, any move we made, my dad had sat me down and we had a discussion about why the move was good and what the move was going to teach me and how I was going to benefit. And I think my dad's an engineer, so he's very um, analytical and cerebral. Um, yep. So he There's instilled a in place. Yep. Yeah. So he instilled in me the process of everything pretty much. And um, as an athlete and now obviously having done my master's as well, um, knowing a little more of the ins and outs of the psychology of sport, of just movement and athletics in general, um, being able to tap into that and see where in my younger career I used it without really knowing that's what I was using. Um, and then being able to explain to athletes now, okay, I've struggled too. And they'll, you know, give me the roll of the eyes and like, yeah, your struggles probably are good day kind of thing. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> there have definitely been times where I struggled with the same thing, but this is how we deal with it. So it's, fun I feel like I almost talk about the mental side of it more than I do the physical mechanics and stuff of um, pitching in our sport I was going to ask you that how do you balance that because I had a coach that was very mental didn't do a lot mechanical we had little you know alterations and corrections but he was so ahead of his time mentally and over the last 20 years you see all these all this growth of um you know, what's all the, the mental game and the understanding of the mental game. And how do you incorporate that into your coaching with your players? Well, I think the biggest thing I talk about with my pitchers is, yes, we're going to work on some mechanical things. But once we're in the circle on game day, we can't be worrying about mechanics. So my big thing with them is, what do we, t what do we say to ourselves? Before each pitch, what are you telling yourself? Um, you know, if we're struggling a little bit and you have one mechanical thing that you think of, like drive out, that's okay. I'm okay with that. But at the same time, are you telling yourself, I'm going to get this person out? Are you telling yourself, I'm going to own you, like, to the hitter? Yeah. Well, how are you talking to yourself? Because I think I laugh when they're like, what are you talking about, coach? I'm like, no matter who I'm facing, I could be facing our kids in a scrimmage. I'm still – I'm going to own you regardless. I love um, that. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get you out because that's the mentality we have to have. And so I talk to ours a lot about no matter the count, no matter the situation, what are you saying to yourself because – what you're saying to yourself matters way more than what I'm yelling from the dugout, what your teammates are telling yourself. If you don't have the confidence and that dire, that dire want to, to commit and execute that pitch, it's not going to work for you. I, I think what you're talking about is important. And for anybody who's listening to this, I think one of the worst things that we've told kids over the years is, well, there's two things, be calm and your mind should be clear. I don't think it's possible to do either of those and the energy it takes to create both of those. And what you just said, which I think is important is when you get into the circle and you tow the rubber, you had a intent and purpose of something. Yours was own them. Mine was embarrass them. I wanted to embarrass the opponent because after I got injured, I didn't have the stuff I used to have, but I could still beat you. And that would really suck if I beat you. Yours was own, right? Mm -hmm. 
how did you come up to that? Was that just? I think, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's certain times that I think I probably thought along the line if I want to embarrass them too. Um, but I think, you know, for me, it was just. Because there's nothing better as a pitcher to me. I mean. No, there's not. I always Getting tell people, that. it's like, you want to worry about being embarrassed, give up a home run and stand there while everyone celebrates and you're just standing there in an island. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I think I came up with Onum pretty much because it was like, if I own one hitter, I'm usually going to start, like the next hitter just saw that hitter get owned. You're going to own the next. And then before long, you know, you kind of dominated the game. Um, so if I can own the circle, then I think, in my opinion, I was in control of not only myself, but um, the game. And I think to your point about calmness and not thinking, you can't be intense and calm at the same time. No, you can't. Well, did you have to amp yourself up? Did you have to talk yourself up? Like when you're in, like, for instance, and just say this is when you were playing in college and you were playing a team that wasn't as good, that's sometimes a trap for a player because they could kind of rest in their laurels. Did you have to talk yourself up as if you were playing Australia or Japan or something like that? Um, I didn't necessarily have to talk myself up and this is going to go against the whole um, buy into the process and not think about outcomes that we all teach kids these days. But yeah, I want to come those, back to that too, because I'm, I'm with you. I know where you're going. Those types of games were the games that I said, you know what, in my mind, I should be able to strike out 17 and I should only be able to, I should only give up two hits. So I had kind of goals, statistical goals in mind, simply because I thought that's what I should be able to do that game. Now, if I didn't hit those goals, I wasn't upset. If I pitched well, now if I pitched poorly, I knew that. And I knew regardless of who we were playing, whether I pitched well or poorly. Um, but in order for me to stay focused in those games, I just gave myself statistical numbers of, okay, let's aim for this. They were, um, were they kind of like achievement rewards versus validations? Like, yeah, I want to get 17 tonight. Like, that's what I want. Yeah, and I believe absolutely. I can. Versus if I don't get 17, I'm – I'm not the type of pitcher I think I was. Yeah, no, by no means did my numbers goals ever um, make me doubt my ability or anything like that. Um, it was definitely a, I think I can do this, so let's, let's try for this tonight. And that was my way of being amped up and staying in the game. So when the game ended and I had 16 or 17, you know, if it was 16, I could be like, oh, that one pitch. You know, I could have done this a little different, but, hey, we'll get it next time. Um, and then, obviously, if I hit my goal or surpassed it, then – I knew that I was able to keep myself focused throughout the entire game. Um, but the reason I, I caught you on the process thing, <laughs> because it's a pet peeve of mine that everyone, I just trusted the process. I'm like, for what? Like if you hear the music dance to it, like if you're in a competitive environment, we use a process to win. You know, we had the system at LSU. It was to our, our goal of our system was to dominate you. I mean, it was our, our system was to win national titles. And Coach Saban at Alabama, his tr trust the process is his trust the process is to make you quit. You know, it was it was to be to make the opponent quit, to be so hard that they. But then we can't obsess about the outcome, so we invest in the process. I think so many people are afraid now to mention wanting to win. Like that's yeah. bad. Oh, that's bad. Oh, I agree. Um, wanting to win or wanting certain statistics you know I think these days you tell a pitcher hey let's try to get this many strikeouts it's like a bad thing I know um, but I think the process is you have to trust your hard work not necessarily the process but we still want an outcome yeah um, it's just not focusing on only the outcome while we're working and but I do I agree that you know the process is a good thing and being able to teach kids that how you work every day is the process but Yes, we need to trust our hard work, but on the time it's ex it's time to execute. If your mind's not right, your process isn't going to work anyways. Thank you. Thank you. I think we got to kind of rebrand a little bit. Uh, obviously, don't try to stay calm, you know. Don't don't try to keep your mind clear and, and use the process to win. Like we got to win something, right? We don't all win in life. We don't all win the big things. We no. can win the little things. Yes. Not so, everybody wins the championship every So year. are you are you intensely, intensely competitive? Um, if I'm actually out there on the field competing, yes. I hate to lose. Where'd that come from? Are you an only child or are you No, actually I'm the oldest of three. Um and I grew up in a family that loved basketball. I played basketball with my cousin growing up who's like a year older than me. Um 
And I think I played basketball against him and lost all the time because he was obviously taller and better. Um, but at the same time, I think he can, uh, or he instilled in me, just, I hated losing. I hated going inside um, and hearing my uncle be like, oh, you let Joe beat you. Or my dad being like, oh, why didn't you work on this? And oh, it just, you know, it was just fun ribbing, but at the same time, um, it, it made me want to keep going. So I'd go home and shoot, shoot baskets in the driveway and try to work on, you know, a hook shot or this and that. And this is at age like 10 and 11, hmm. just to try to be able to shoot over my cousin. Um, and then once I picked up softball, um, you know, I think the bet, the best and worst thing, my first game ever in little league that they called me in and I tried pitching for the first time, I struck out the first hitter. And I think watching her swing and miss, um, instilled in me something that I just wanted to make everyone do that. Mm. And so, um, from that point on, it was, you know, pitching is what I fell in love with, but at the same time, I fell in love with the ability to, you know, manipulate the ball, manipulate speeds, do this and that to embarrass people or own people. Um, and then once I felt success in that, it was, there was no letting up. I just wanted that. I wanted that to occur over and over. Um, and at the same time, you know, I just grew up playing sports, watching sports, watching my dad play pickup basketball. Um, and, you know, winning feels good. Winning feels good. It's contagious. Did you, when you went to Texas, um, mm -hmm. where was the softball program in relation to where it was when you were there? In other words, you know, were you, I mean, you had a lot of early success. You took some time off to do the Olympics. What, how, I mean, was it, were you seen as like the next piece? Were you part of the developmental piece? Yeah, I, so um, the program was fairly young when I got there. I want to say four or five years old, five years old, maybe. Cause I know we celebrated the 10th anniversary, maybe six years old. I think we celebrated the 10th anniversary my junior year, which would be after my red shirt year. Um, but they had gone to the world series once they, Krista Williams, who also was an Olympian transferred from UCLA to Texas. So when she transferred, um, they did make it to the World Series for the first time. And I think at that point in time was the youngest program to ever make a World Series, I believe. And so I was the next piece or the piece that was going to continue, carry on this one trip to the World Series. And were you and, always a UT fan? Uh, you know, what's funny is my parents both grew up in Illinois. So I was not born and raised like most people in Texas to choose either A&M or Texas. Mm -hmm. um, I just somewhere along the way liked Texas. I had a shirt that I got for Christmas in like fourth grade, and I think I kept it all the way through high school <laughs> um, that said University of Texas, and I loved it. Um, so when I was going through the recruiting process, I knew in my heart that that's where I wanted to go. Um, but my parents did a very good job of making sure that I at least explored other things so I had something to compare to. Um, and so I did. I visited Washington, talked with Stanford, UCLA. OU, you know, I coach Murphy at Alabama. I know mm -hmm. you talk about him a lot too. Um, yep. He, he actually recruited me pretty heavily too, but um, there was just something in me that wanted to stay home close to home and be able to, my, my love for winning is also, I love being the underdog as well. I think, cause for most of my career until I went to college, I was, um, I don't think a lot of people uh, knew what I was capable of at a young age. And so um, I wanted to stay home and help Texas beat the big dogs instead of going and being a big dog. That's kind of a unique perspective for University of Texas because they always want to be the biggest dog on the block, don't they? Yeah. And well, at the time, we were still a young program. Yeah. So yeah. I, your softball would, program was young, but yeah. But yeah. oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. yeah. Just, do, you, do you still use the under, uh, when you pitch, uh, I mean, while you were through college, did you still use the underdog mentality? Um, I, I mean, because you can I tell think, whatever story you want in your head. Yeah. No, I think for me, um, well, I shouldn't say that. My first two years, yeah, I think I did. I was, um, you know, my freshman year, I got thrown in the fire. I was having to throw a lot of games. There were only two of us. Um, the only returning pitcher we had got hurt, so she was redshirting. And so me and the other freshmen were thrown into the fire and had to figure out, hey, we're either going to sink or swim. Um, thankfully we bonded together and both ended up figuring out how to swim pretty well. Um, but the, uh, opportunity to be able to throw in that, but people didn't know who we were. And at the same time, here we are in our first college season and having to figure out how to win big games. 
Um, and so I think I thought of myself as an underdog those first two years. Now I redshirted after my sophomore year to go to the 2004 Olympics. Now, after coming back from that, there was no way I could put my, in my head that I was the underdog. No, no, um, you were, how, what was that like to be, to, to show up and to have that success in the Olympics? And I, I want to talk to you about representing, you know, representing the country. I, I had some mm -hmm. teammates that did, and I had some dear friends that uh, pitched when baseball won the gold medal was one of the core pitchers that got that. And I'm always fascinated, but I want to, I want to, before we get there, I want to talk about like that transition that to take it mentally from the underdog to now, now all of a sudden you are everyone, everyone that shows up wants a piece of you, both media fans, but the opponents, like they know they're facing you. Yeah, it was different. Um, I had to, I had to reframe things, not from necessarily underdog to now I'm on top and everybody's aiming for me. But at the same time, I had to remind myself that it, at that point, it's okay to fail sometimes as much as I hate it. Um, because I do know, I remember my mom and I weren't super, we're super close now, but we weren't necessarily when I was in college. And I remember having a conversation with her one time where I said, I go, if I lose, everyone's going to be like, oh, she's not that, she's really not that good. Like, or doubt why was I on the Olympic team if I come back to college and lose. And I had to remind myself that, you know, you can't be perfect as much as we all try. And a lot of people want to have that perfectionism mentality. Um, as much as I strive for, for perfectionism growing up, I always was able to accept being good, being good enough, or just being excellent that day. Yeah. So how did you transfer that? Because I see a lot of kids, perfectionism works as you're on the climb. Mm -hmm. But when you're trying to sustain a certain level of excellence, perfectionism can be destructive. How did you, how did you transition that to seeing, I mean, because perfection is also pretty close to being capable for you. I mean, when you're a pitcher and you're striking out 17, 18 people, you're not far away from being able to achieve what we would identify as a perfect game mentality. You know, I think I was able to transition it just because I was exposed to a lot of adversity or adverse situations um, as I transitioned from each level. Hmm. Um, so even we go all the way back to travel ball going from my 16 U team to the first 18 U team I saw, you know, the whole point was my dad was like, we're moving you up a year early because I want you to get your tail hit around and figure out how to pitch better. Wow. Uh, it's different. And there was, yeah. And there were games that, you know, we may have lost one, nothing. And I came off the mound crying and was like, I need another pitch. And my dad's like, you pitched fine. And I looked at him and it was, that was probably the turning point where, okay, you can still pitch well and lose a game. Which is the truth. And yeah. but at the time when you're younger, you don't really put all that together. Um, and then again, from, you know, travel ball, I played with the national team straight out of high school. So I remember my first tournament with the national team in Canada and I got my tail hit. <laughs> and it was like figuring out how, okay, now I have to figure out how to be successful and um, re, you know, regroup again. So there were times where I definitely hit adversity and knew that while my perfectionist mentality training um, it couldn't, I couldn't take that onto the field because you're not going to be, even if you are perfect, a hitter can still hit your best pitch out sometimes. Um, and yeah. I've seen that happen I, even in college. There's one. It's probably never happened to you, but trust me, it does happen. No, I, uh, <laughs> there's actually, I wish I, I wish, um, social media and TV coverage and all that was just as big when I was in college, but there, I threw a drop ball literally over the girls to, uh, tennis shoe tops, like it probably was going to hit her shoestrings if she hadn't swung and she hit it out and TV panned. And I went, wow. Cause there's, I was like, I have yeah. no clue how, how you hit that. Yeah. Isn't that great? Isn't that a great yeah. feeling? Right. What, um, when you're coaching players, I still want to come back to the Olympics, but when you're coaching players, it's gotta be difficult for somebody who's had the level of success that you've had where I'm not saying it came easy, but the wisdom that you've gained as a pitcher through those trials and tribulations is hard sometimes to communicate to an 18 year old who sees you, it's this level, right? I mean, you're at a level where they probably have your picture on their wall. I don't mean to flatter you, but it's, I mean, you're on the Mount Rushmore of pitchers. So what, how do you, how do you communicate to them without them, that intimidation of your standard is up here, but they forgot what got you there sometimes. I think the, the number, the easiest part of that is obviously when I first took this job at Texas state, I was still playing. And then I took a little break, but now I'm playing again. Yeah, I'll um, come back to so, that. Yeah. Well, but they get to see 
they get to see me work every day. Um, okay. Whether I'm throwing to our kids as extra to get them ready for a game, whether they see me in the weight room, um, they go watch me run after practice, whatever it is, they see, they see me work. And so, so you've almost become a peer a little bit because you're bit. on the same journey. You're on a yeah. journey just at a different stage. Yeah, a little bit. And I think the other, the other piece that's good is I have a memory that's insanely detailed somehow. Um, and so a lot of times if we hit a certain situation, for instance, my, um, our ace pitcher here at Texas State, Randy Rupp, just graduated last year. But her freshman year, first tournament the same weekend four years ago, you know, she one hit Sam Houston. We think we're great. And then all of a sudden we played two games on Friday and we get our tail hit around. We gave up, I want to say like five home runs, eight doubles, you know, all within two games. And she's bawling her eyes out. And I'm like, hey, let's just finish the tournament and we're going to, we'll talk about this at the end. We finished the tournament and I said, hey, I want you to do me a favor because there's at least archives online. Go back, go to Texas Softball's website and go back to my freshman year, which is 2002, because of course she's like, what year was that? I go, <laughs> and go all the way back to the beginning and click on the first tournament. She was like, why? And I was like, I left the first tournament of my college career with a 14 ERA. She was wow. like, no way. And I'm like, yeah, I went one and two or one and three. I go, I played Fullerton and gave up three home runs in one inning. I was like, and, but at the same time, you can either let that define you or you figure out how to go through it. Um, so I guess the best part of being able to translate with them is I can usually call upon an exact point of where I dealt with something similar okay. um, and talk to them about how we worked out of it. Or in that case, it was simply, hey, go look at this stat. And she looked at it and was like, but you still finished the year with like whatever my ERA was. And I was like, because you can only get better. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> When you go to the Olympics, what's that like? I mean, I'm assuming you do the opening ceremonies. One of the two times we got to go to opening ceremonies. Yeah, because y'all um, are playing. The... Y'all are playing sometimes off-site. Y'all are playing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of strange. Are you going to make this time you got to, right? I'm assuming. Oh, four, we got, we didn't get to because um, we really? played the next morning or, well, the next day at like two o'clock. And you don't really get back from opening ceremonies till like two, three a.m. because of buses and all that. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, wait, we got to because we didn't play till two days later. So, standing out there and represent, I mean, you, you've represented Team USA in a lot of different forms and fashion, but the Olympics mm -hmm. has got to be something just different. Oh, the Olympics is absolutely. There's no words to explain the intensity of your emotions um, compared to any other international event. I think the biggest thing is now you see representatives from every country. You know, Pan American Games, you obviously only have the Pan American countries. Uh, you go to world championships, there's more countries, but it's still just softball. Like, mm -hmm. we don't share world championships with any other sport. And then you go to the Olympics and you know, you see the Federers, the Nadals, the NBA guys. That's what I was going to ask. What's that? Because my, my teammate was on the 92 Olympics, the first year of the dream team. And he's got a picture walking out in Barcelona. And the, he was like, I positioned myself. He was a first round draft pick. So mm -hmm. he thought he was a big deal too. I love Rick to death. He's probably listening to this. And he always acted like, hey, I've been here before type. But he didn't that night. He was like, that's Michael Jordan, Charles Barkley right behind me. You know, how do you – I mean, that's got to be amazing to go sit and go see other sports and the world's best at their sport. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's awesome to see the biggest collection of the best athletes you can ever put together in one village. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously at opening ceremonies in one ceremony for the most point. Uh, um, oh, wait, I know, you know, they usually house each country in a different building before we walk out into the ceremony. So we're all, you know, United States is all in one. And I have pictures with Coach K, uh, I think it's Dwight Howard, Carmelo. And yet, you know, they get it. But while we're all, I think Coach K did a great job of conveying to the NBA guys, you know what, you're on the same level as these people right now. Like everyone's yeah. an Olympian. Here you're not special. Like, yeah, you're, yeah, you're all special. But no one's yeah. more special than somebody else. Yeah. No, and they were all so awesome taking pictures with all of us. Um, Jason Kidd was like making sure I got on a bus with to make sure I got back to the village and he completely knew who I was was a fan of softball it was really crazy. I'm sitting here like really you you know who I am like that's awesome um but it was um it's quite an experience and then yeah you know you get to see like I said the Federers the Nadals Yao Ming like from other countries that we obviously watch and you almost forget sometimes that they're not 
I don't want to say they're not American, not that I assume everyone's yeah. from the United States, but you watch them you're like, oh yeah, they're here too. I forgot about that. Like yeah. and you just see them. Then sometimes it's funny because I feel like on TV they look a lot bigger than they are in person. Yeah. What do you what what was one sport you went to? Or I don't know if you had the chance because of the length of y'all's tournament. What was one sport that you went to that was or what what's one sport you're gonna do this time? I did get to go to a soccer game one okay. time, which was really cool because I think that's the one sport I played it growing up, but after I quit doing that, um, never really followed it a whole lot. Um, but you go watch international soccer and it's just another level. Yeah. So that was really cool. And then, you know, I don't know if we'll ever get to actually go to one, but I would love to go watch a gym- gymnastics. I think they're amazing. Yeah. Those are evidently the hardest tickets, right? I'm yeah. yeah. Those in track is what I've heard are pretty hard. Although track's a big stadium. So you might be able to get them, just not good ones. Maybe you can pull a little bit of legacy card or something. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. What do you, um, let's go back to the mental game here for a little bit, because mm-hmm. one of the challenges um, is, you know, developing youth athletes today and the pressures these kids have, the, you know, we, we often knock on the millennials, but millennials are the most resourceful people we've ever really seen. I mean, they're tremendous to be able to overcome any challenge. They're just different. They just have, I mean, they grew up with Google. So yeah. everything's available to them. From your understanding and, and your immersion in the mental game and you as a coach, what are some recommendations for coaches listening to this? I think the first thing, and I mean, this is my 11th year coaching now, so I've kind of been through a little bit of a generational change as well. Um, But the first thing they want to know is that you care about them before they care at all what you know about their sport. Um, I figured that out pretty fast. They want to have a relationship with you before they want to know how to get better at their sport. Um, And I don't want to say that's gender specific. Cause I don't really think it is um, just talking to, you know, some of our baseball players here or male athletes. I know it's the same thing. The ones that can say, Oh yeah, I loved my coach. He, you know, I talked to him about this and that and are the ones that usually excelled more than others. Um, is it tough though from a coach standpoint, because sometimes these kids see that and they think, I always say love-based leadership. The interpretation of love-based leadership has caused a lot of problems because people think it's all positive reinforcement when really great coaches have to get on you on occasion. Yeah, no, I, it's not, you know, I think the biggest thing is they want to know you care, but that doesn't mean you don't expect more from them at times. Okay, well so. And I think the biggest thing is explaining that um, mentality to them. And, you know, I know my pitchers will tell you, they'll be the first, they're always like, people are so shocked when we say that you're really nice. And I'm like, probably because they see my game face and it doesn't look nice. But then you also talk to them and they're like, oh no, but when like she's mad at us, she really gets mad at us. But it's one of those where I don't use yelling as the way to get through to them unless I am upset and that's what we need to use at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I try to talk them through things in a calmer manner just because, and not, not a, hey, you're great, but we need to execute this pitch. No, we need to execute this pitch because, and I think you're capable of it because I've seen you do this. So what do we need to do to make sure that pitch that you threw two hitters ago happens every time. Hmm. Um, and then you, I, a lot of times create a dialogue more so than just talking at them. Um, so I will say, Hey, okay, you threw that pitch two pitches ago and it was great. What did you feel on that one that you didn't feel on this one? Or what were you telling yourself? Cause sometimes it's just like, Oh, it was O2. So I was just thinking, Hey, spin it off the plate. Okay. Well it moved more. So maybe we just need to think spin it off the plate a little more, even, unless we're way behind the count. Hmm. Um, but I think the biggest thing is it doesn't mean being positive. It doesn't mean, you know, rah, rah all the time. In fact, I've probably not rah, rah as near as much as they would like me to be sometimes because I want them to achieve what I think their potential is. Mm-hmm. Um, I hate the word potential sometimes, but, um, you know, I know what I think they're capable of and I want them to be able to reach that. But at the same time, I'm going to remind them that, you know, sure, there's sometimes when we're down that we need to pick me up. But at the same time, as soon as we get picked me up, we're going to talk about, hey, how do we get better? Um, Because tough or, you know, a loving, a loving relationship with your coach isn't all about, hey, it's just not all roses and sunshine. I say, I say true love-based leadership is high demand leadership with a lot of reinforcements. Yeah. I think, you know, the higher, the higher the demands, the higher the ceiling is for them. Mm -hmm. Um, If you just sit there and let them escape 
or, you know, accept, not escape, accept lower standards because you just want to be positive all the time, they're not going to grow. Yeah. Um, they grow from knowing that you want what's best for them and that you're going to keep pushing them to more. What do you, what do you see about travel ball and that? Because some questions about, <laughs> some questions about travel balls, it's kind of becoming like AAU basketball. It's like, I mean, we didn't win. Like I was, I'll, I'll, I'll out her, <clears throat> but Stephanie Van Brakel, right. We we're having a conversation one time and we went to a showcase. We just happened to be there and she was there doing some, she was just doing some, she was speaking or something. And I'm like, that game just ended It's zero, zero. And they're shaking hands like in the third inning. She goes, oh, yeah, that's a showcase. I'm like, well, what is a showcase? She goes, yeah, yeah it's a non-competitive environment. You could tell it just yep. boiled her. I love Stephanie. But um, <laughs> we, had one, we had an epic battle at the World Series one year. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Um, and those are two personalities right there where you guys, what I love about watching y'all is that mindset that both of you were out there for purpose and business. There was no like, hey, I'm going to figure this out. It was I'm coming after you. Yeah. What, so what do you, how do you, how do you, well, what's your impression of the travel ball world and what's your recommendation? You are travel ball czar for the week. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Stephanie hit it right on the money is everything is a showcase now. So we even get emails where it's like, Hey, you know, we didn't have a great weekend. We went over three, but I went six for eight with four singles, a double. And then I dropped a bunt for base hit, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, one, there's two things wrong with that. We're not worried that we lost. But yeah. two, you're worried about yourself and your stats. Mm -hmm. I would rather a kid email me and say, hey, we went 3-0. and I went 0-2, but I had two sack flies and sacked a runner over. Yeah. Like, now we have a kid who's worried about her team. Yes, obviously, you're going to tell it. I'm not saying you're selfish because you're telling us your stats because if we're going to recruit you, we kind of need to know what, how you're performing. But we put them in this environment where, no, it's not competitive. Um, before I came here to Texas State, I actually was at a Division II school, St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas, for three years. And we did a um, assignment where we made our kids write about their most competitive moment ever. Could be high school, could be travel ball, could be what it could have been in college already if they were a returner. 90% of them wrote about high school, which I laugh because to me, high school was, I was competitive and I wanted to win, but I was playing high school ball to keep playing in the time that we couldn't be playing travel ball. Hmm. If I had to have written an assignment, it would have been at nationals and travel ball when we were playing for the national championship. These kids don't write about travel ball because it's not competitive because it can end in a zero, zero tie and we go yeah. shake hands and everything's great. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when Steph and I grew up playing, there were no showcases. You may have had a friendly around Robin on a weekend that you weren't in a real tournament. And that would have been the only time that, you might have showcased but right. that was more of like let's let everyone play and get some reps in yeah we're going to put people at different positions we're going to you know substitution rules are going to be kind of off the table we're right. going to yeah yeah but glorified one scrimmages biggest, yeah. one of the biggest fall tournaments we recruit is the ronald mcdonald and i laughed because i went recruiting at it like three years ago and i stay at my parents house when i do because it's in houston and my mom still had my trophy from when we actually won the ronald mcdonald way years ago you don't win it anymore you go play five games and go home Really? There's no bracket. There's no. Do you think, so, do you think there's no bracket because kids wouldn't do it because it's blending the purpose now? I mean, cause no, parents think, are spending a lot of money on travel ball. I think kids would play it if there was a bracket and there's some, um, there's some organizations that are starting host tournaments where you get your three or four game guarantee and pool play. And then they go to a single elimination bracket. Right. Because you need to learn how to play to win. You yeah. really do. I mean, 100%. it's not. Like I said, you can go have a friendly on a weekend that you don't have a real tournament, but when you have a real tournament, play to win and yes. figure out how to get those competitive juices going. But at the same time, if you're a player that gets amped up, let's figure out how to contain it to be able to play. Yep. Um, but yeah, you see, you know, a kid walks and we go put in another runner and let her hit again and again, if she walks again and it's like, okay, you know, let's play the game, how it's going to be played. Cause that they get, I can't tell you how many get here and realize that you don't get courtesy runners for pitchers and catchers in college <laughs> or pitchers and catchers that don't know how to base run because they get a courtesy runner every time that they play in travel ball. So I think, you know, the competitive environment in travel ball has dropped a little bit because of showcases, because everything is like, let me go just play good and hope a yeah. college sees me versus let me play well for my team and let us be winning. Um, I think when I played, especially Colorado was the big tournament that, 
you wanted to get to Saturday or Sunday because I think whatever day it was, as soon as, if you lost out on one of those two days, that was the day the colleges could finally talk to you in person. Oh. So if you were on a good team and playing, now, you know what, as soon as you lost your game, you probably still finished in the top 10, but now the colleges were there. And that was a consolation to losing, but now you get the opportunity to explore your future with somebody. Mm. Um, nowadays, it's just, you know, yeah. whoever has a, whoever has a, a pool game going at that time is who you can talk to. Yeah. Uh, what about, before I get to your journey back to the Olympics, I want to ask one other question. What about coachability? Because I think travel balls impacted that too. I agree. Um, I think the way I, I love that our sport's grown. I really do. But I think we've also grown so much and started to put titles, especially this like gold title on teams that supposedly mm. means you're like one of the top teams, but yet you don't have to do anything to be able to call yourself gold. You can, oh. I could go start a team tomorrow and name it the purple people eater gold and we would be a gold team. Um, but I think the fact the sport's grown is great, but at the same time, now we team hop. Now, if we're not playing instead of, for instance, my situation growing up, dad put me on a travel team. I was good with it. I played left field. I hit a little bit, pitched the mop-up innings. After a year and a half, we got in a situation where we didn't have a pitcher at the tournament that time. Our other one got in a bind. They're like, all right, here you go. Bases loaded, no outs. Let's see what you do. Got a pop-up and two strikeouts. And from then on, they trusted me with some innings. Um, and so I think, you know, I saw the process kind of unfold. But I also didn't just team hop because I wasn't starting right I was right about away. to say, today's world, you would have been team hop three times trying to find the right organization. Right. So instead of – No, maybe you process, wouldn't have, but that would have been no, – Right. Yeah. But the process we want people to buy into is the process of earn your spot, get better, and then you'll get your reward. But we don't do that now. If, you're, if mm -mm. Sally's not starting, she's gonna, we're going to leave and go find a new team. Well, surprise, there's people in college that have to be role players – and if they don't learn how to do that at any point of their career, they get here and they're not coachable because they've always been a starter. Well, no, you just always found a team that was bad enough that you could be a starter. Yeah. I, I, I tell a story that when I was a sophomore, I, I played one year varsity in high school. And when I was a, a sophomore, I had to catch batting practice in our summers and our coach was a musician. Um, and I hated this guy, hated him because I had to catch batting practice every day before a game. And I was always too worn out to play in the game. And it would have been so easy for my dad to pull me and put me on another summer league team. But he's like, no, you're going to suck it up. I pitched three times that summer, all summer. And uh, came back but the next year. But it probably lit a fire under you. Greatest thing I ever did. Greatest thing I ever did. Yeah. All right, let's talk about lighting the fire. <laughs> let's talk about your return to the limelight. I think it's fascinating. Uh, I think it's phenomenal, actually. So what was that? What started that? That's a good question. <laughs> was it that you were throwing BP to your hitters and go, I still got some good stuff here. Um, no. Well, so actually kind of, but not necessarily to my hitters. Um, so two, two years ago, um, head coach Ken Erickson, he's from, he coaches at USF, but he's our national team head coach. He had actually asked me, he had hinted to me, like, would you play again? And I kind of, you know, no, I like my job. I love coaching. I'm good. Even though in the back of my mind, I was like, I can still play. Um, but I really do love coaching. It's what I've always wanted to do. So, um, you know, when we, we joke and say it's just another day in paradise around here, but really there's no other job I'd want to be doing. Um, and he asked me to put my name into the coaching pool for the national team. So I did. But then as they started kind of emailing out assignments and can you make this event or can you make this tryout, in my heart, I was just like, there's no part of me that wants to coach the national team. And I talked to my um, head coach here, Coach Woodard, and she was like, well, why? And I was like, because I could still do it. She was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, I could still throw, in my opinion, as well as, as those the kids I'm going to be coaching. I don't wish to go back to college and play college again. I did my four years, loved it, and grew up and went to the real world. I was like, but national team stuff, I could still do that. And then she kind of was like, well, do you want to? And in my head, I was like, well, I don't know. I haven't really explored that thought process. Um, and then she came to me at one point and was like, if it's something you really want to do, then we'll make it work. Cause that was my big thing. I didn't want to have to give up my job here cause I love it. Um, and so as soon as she said that, I was like, Hmm, the wheels really started spinning. I called my, my dad cause he's kind of been my rock through my whole career. 
And he you know, gave me the, I've told you that from the get-go. You should have always had that in the back of your mind. Um, so he was all for it. And um, I had gotten married at the time, or I have been married now, but I had gotten married since I retired. And so I had to talk to the husband. You know, this is what the time commitment's going to be. There's going to be a lot of time apart. Not easy. Um, he was all for it. He didn't want me to retire the, when I did three years ago. So everyone in my life. He told me that. It. He told me that at lunch. Yeah. <laughs> everyone that's on light on board with it and so I was like you know what I think it's just a sign I got to give it a go um and you know there was part of me in deep in my heart that the finality of 08 because we weren't in the 2012 Olympics and it didn't look like we'd get back in 16 um the finality of that loss ate at me so much um in the year that followed that that I just felt like as much as I want to go and help all those girls that are on the team now um, that haven't been to an Olympics yet. And I want them to experience that at the greatest um, level. But there's a small part of me that there's some unfinished business that I just really need to take care of. What happened in that uh, international that knocked you guys out? Because that was a massive upset. It was. Um, so we were playing great. And really, it was probably the biggest nightmare of a game that any of us could have pictured the card came up that day mm -hmm. yep. um i was rolling for three innings uh felt good drop ball was working we were striking people out i want to say if i remember right it was either the end of the third inning or the fourth inning um we gave up one run but you know in our minds that's okay we'll get our one run back but then i gave up a bomb um to dead center and that was kind of the nail in the coffin for me it was like oh crap like now what are we going to do because Wayno is a great pitcher so one run we can make who'd y'all lose to who'd y'all lose to japan japan okay mm -hmm. yeah and so then at the same time for that's what happened for me if you ask any person on that team they'll tell you what part of the game they screwed up at um because we've had these conversations and there's about five of us who take the blame <laughs> um but you know we had one of our best hitters come up with bases loaded twice and hit in a double play and i don't think i've ever seen her hit into a double play um, we had another runner, you know, another Andrea Duran, who's a teammate of mine. She'll point out that she was up with runners on and couldn't get a hit. And um, it was just one of those that the every stars time aligned the wrong way. The stars aligned the wrong way for us. Um, anything that could have gone wrong did. So has that fed to y'all's hunger now? I think so. Um, you know, Monica Abbott and I are the only two that are on the roster for this 2019 summer that um, experienced that. But I think the younger players who are now part of this national team, they watched it and they saw um, our fall from glory, so to speak. And so they're anxious to get there. And yes, they've won Worlds twice. So technically they're on top. But to be able to put the nail in the coffin there and say, yes, we are. We are back on top. So one last question for you. You've been gracious with your time. I know it's opening day for you. Um, to, to put yourself out like you did with no guarantee to be that vulnerable. I mean, it could have gone, they could have easily said, ah, no, thank you. You just don't have it. Yeah, they could have. How, did you have to fight that in your head? Um, a little bit. I think the second I made the decision to try again, um, which was actually October of 17, I literally went to work the next day as far as getting back in the gym, getting back running. Um, throwing was probably the last thing I added back in just because I wanted to get strong again first. Mm -hmm. um, but as soon as I started throwing, the joy of watching the ball move and hit my spots, um, you know, my husband sits in the driveway and hands me balls while I throw to a net and he laughs at me because I talk to myself. And sometimes he tells me I don't talk to myself the way I'd ask my kids to talk to themselves. And I said, that's okay. I'm a little different. We talked about that before. I get it. I understand. I think it's brilliant. Um, Got to find your voice. But at the same time, there's times I throw a pitch and I'm like, you know, I'm like, yes. So I'll be like, oh, no one hits that. And he's just like, holy cow, who, who you're a different animal. Um, but when that came back, I knew, I just knew in my heart that I was going to be able to do it. Um, and at the same time, I went into tryouts and after the first day, um, I was having such a great experience just talking to the younger players and being there and interacting and on the field again that I kind of first time in my heart it hit me that I was like you know what one I think I have the stuff to be able to make this roster but if I don't I'm going to be okay with that because there's no way I can look back at the last year and a half and not think I 
could have done anything different. Um, but yeah, I think there are a lot of people that thought maybe I came out of retirement with a promise and there was absolutely no promise whatsoever. There was yeah. no guarantee. Your, your reaction shows that. Yeah. Yeah. There was no guarantee. And that probably might be one of the most rewarding journeys I've been on was just that year, year and four months to be able to make it back and, and do what I did at tryouts. Well, we'll be rooting for you. And, Thank you. Uh, excited for your journey and your return to that competitive environment. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your time on this. Thanks for having me.